word Bible comes from the Greek word for papyrus plant, biblos, since the leaves of that plant were used for paper. Ancient Bibles were sometimes printed on parchment made from sheep or goatskins. It required an entire flock of sheep to provide the material for one fourth century New Testament. The cost of a Bible in the 1300s might easily amount to a priest's whole yearly income. The Bible's chapter divisions were created in the early 1200s by a lecturer at the University of Paris. Its current verse divisions were not fully developed until 1551. The Geneva Bible was quoted by William Shakespeare over 5,000 times in his plays. Most early Bibles included the 14 apocryphal books. In fact, the book of Daniel had 15 chapters, not 12. Three of those chapters came from the apocryphal books. One of the King James translators, the Archbishop of Canterbury, decreed that any printer who printed the King James Bible without the Apocrypha would be fined and imprisoned for one year. The first Bible printed in the United States was printed in 1663. It was a translation for the Algonquin Indians. By 400 A.D., the Bible had been translated into 500 languages. By 500 A.D., the Bible had been reduced to only one language. How did this happen? I'm holding a Bible that was printed in 1480, 25 years after the invention of the Gutenberg Press with the movable type that revolutionized knowledge and its proliferation as we know it. Prior to this printing press being invented, everything that was recorded had to be done by hand on parchment or vellum or some kind of writing surface, rice paper if you were an oriental, even stone tablets if you lived in particular parts of the world. That's what you had to do to preserve what you wanted preserved from generation to generation in written form. I'm holding a beautiful Bible. It's one of the most beautiful printings that was ever done. It was done in Venice. In fact, this Bible is the first Bible ever printed in which a title page was employed to tell us where it was printed and by whom, things we take for granted today. It began with Moses on Mount Sinai. We know he received the Ten Commandments. He spent 40 days in the mountain and he came down with the Ten Commandments. That's more or less the point that we date the beginning of the preservation of God's Word. God gave to Moses the story of creation. He gave to Moses the story of God's blessing on his chosen people. And he gave prophecies. And he gave laws. And he gave rules and orders of how those people to, were to live and to relate to God Almighty. He actually wrote these things down in Hebrew on a writing surface just like this. I'm holding in my hand the book of Lamentations. Of course, Moses didn't write the book of Lamentations. Jeremiah did. But at the time that the Torah, the Pentateuch, was recorded, Moses did it. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And Joshua writes the last chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. He describes how Moses died. And the five books are the legacy of Moses as to not only the wanderings in the wilderness, the battles that were fought and won, the battles that were fought and lost, the story of disobedience from every imagination that you could possibly conceive of. God let us know how people fail to relate to him based on how he wants them to. And that's part of the story of the Pentateuch the first five books of the Bible, and Moses gave us those. Ezra assembled the Bible using these Hebrew scrolls. And with other revelation of God as, that Ezra received, he assembled what we call the, the Old Testament. And he assembled it in the Hebrew language. And this is the language 
of the Bible that Ezra took back to, to Jerusalem and proceeded in the temple worship to educate the people to the ways of God. And it was done on parchment, on a material like this sheepskin, very carefully by scribes that gave their lives to make sure that the Bible was preserved. This is a thousand-year-old Torah, the first five books of the Bible, that would not be unlike what Ezra assembled in the fourth century BC of the whole Bible. They could have easily just kept the books separate, like one book of Genesis, one book of Exodus, which they did in separate scrolls, which would be easier to to protect and easier to preserve versus something bulky like this, because this just being the first five books, uh, it would take several hundred feet, perhaps 500 feet in a script written this large to lay down the text of the whole Old Testament. But this thousand-year-old scroll is perfect proof in almost an absolute perfect rendering. Uh, we can compare this, for example, to the Dead Sea Scrolls from information that's a thousand years older than this. And there's not a single heir of a single book as it's been transmitted from generation to generation. So thanks to the Hebrews and to the Greek-speaking people of Constantinople and Eastern Orthodoxy, the text has been preserved. By AD 210, Origen listed the books that he considered to be scripture. He excluded James and Jude because they were not apostolic in terms of their authorship. In 315, Eusebius communicated some of the controversies of other books, including the Revelation. In 315, Athanasius listed 27 books in his annual letter to the churches under his jurisdiction. This is the first time a church leader would identify the very books Christians today call the New Testament. Cyril would recommend his own list of books in 340, as did the Council of Laodicea in 364, Epiphanius in 370, Gregory in 375, and Philastrius in 380. Jerome was the most outstanding scholar of his day. In 382, he was commissioned to translate the Bible from the Greek into Latin. It became known as the Latin Vulgate, Vulgate meaning common. He put an asterisk by the apocryphal books, saying he did not know if they were inspired because they had not originated in the Hebrew language, as were the 39 books of the Old Testament. In A.D. 397, the Synod of Carthage, officially declared 27 books of the New Testament era to be accepted as Scripture. The Septuagint was accepted as Old Testament Scripture, with a footnote that the 14 apocryphal books were to be included for instruction and history, but not as Holy Writ. As centuries passed, the Vulgate would be corrupted by unfaithful copy, and the interpretation of the canon was restricted to a few dozen scholars in each generation. By 400 AD, the scriptures had been translated into over 500 languages. But now the church in Rome allowed only one language, and that language was Latin. The technique to sustain its power was simple. Control people's minds by controlling their education, and control their education by controlling their language. One empire, many languages, but only Latin was allowed for education and instruction. The Pope was elevated to God's sole agent to lead the church, and resistance to his leadership was an act of heresy, punishable by excommunication or death. A world that had become free in Christ would now be plunged into a thousand-year period, from A.D. 400 to 1400 a period that would become known as the Dark and Middle Ages. The Church demanded confession, penance, pilgrimages, the adoration of saints, and the doctrine of transubstantiation. 
which says that during Mass, the bread and wine become, in substance, the body and blood of Jesus. Indulgences were granted for crimes that ranged from adultery to murder and rendered the state powerless to prosecute the criminal. Pope Julius granted an indulgence to the future Pope Leo X, who was married with two children. A list of tariffs for various indulgences was established by Pope John XXII and first published by Pope Leo X. You could kill a man for $1.75. You could ravish a virgin for $2. A priest could keep a mistress for $2.25. Or for $12, you could be absolved of all crimes together. Augustine's proclamation of prostitution as a necessary evil resulted in over 100,000 prostitutes being employed by the church. And their symbol of power was marvelous buildings such as St. Peter's Basilica in Rome that threatened to bankrupt the church unless new devices for raising money could be employed. One such way was to extract enormous sums of money from parishes by granting pardon for penance in purgatory. Popes Julius and Leo declared the holy wars to justify the mass slaughter of Jews in order to steal their money and possessions to finance the building of the Vatican. Pope Leo X revealed the truth of his convictions when he stated, How profitable the fable of Christ has been to us. This was the age of two popes, one in France and one in Rome. They were making a mockery of Christianity. Urban VI and Clement VII were each claiming to be pope, and both were threatening the other with excommunication. Urban called for war. John Wycliffe replied, How dare he make a token of Christ on the cross as a banner to lead us to slay Christian men for the love of two false priests? The Pope, Wycliffe said, was not the voice of God on earth. The Bible was. The Pope, he said, may not even be among those chosen for heaven. How was the word preserved during these centuries leading up to the birth of John Wycliffe? Well, God's always had a way, and one such way was in northern Scotland. On the northwest corner of Scotland is a little isle called Iona. And there, a man named Columba, in 563 A.D., started a Bible college. And that Bible college would continue through the Dark Ages. The vast majority of evangelism that took place for the next 700 years would take place as a result of that Bible college. The secret society in Scotland were called Chaldees. These Chaldees are descendants of the Bible College at Iona. It was an underground movement. Where did that movement begin? Tradition has it, it began at Glastonbury in England shortly after the crucifixion of Christ when Joseph of Arimathea, the very man who took Christ's body from the cross and allowed his tomb to be used as the tomb of Christ. It's that man Joseph of Arimathea that tradition tells us went to Glastonbury and built the first church above ground with the name Christian on it in history. Joseph of Arimathea was called a Chaldee. The word means certain stranger. And that certain stranger from that established church at Glastonbury which the remains are there today of what Joseph of Arimathea did there, that we have this underground society that existed through the Dark Ages and into the Middle Ages. John Wycliffe was a product of the choosing of that secret society. This church that we're sitting in was built in the 13th century. We're in Lutterworth, England. About a hundred years after the church was constructed, John Wycliffe became the pastor. 
He was the most powerful man in England. He had come more or less as a refugee from the criticism that was mounting against him at Oxford, where he was president of Balliol College and the most popular teacher on Oxford campus. John Wycliffe taught in this lecture hall behind me for 10 years, from 1362 to 1372. Hundreds of men from all over Europe and England came to this lecture hall at Balliol College where John Wycliffe was the president and listened to the doctrines that he was laying down. There was no printing press. Students had to copy down by hand the lecture notes, take them to their respective homes, wherever they may be in whatever country, and in turn, those lecture notes would become ammunition for those that dissented against the tyranny that was being heaped on them by the establishment, the established church at Rome. John Wycliffe translated the Bible, but he also translated other literature. He prepared a little tract called The Wicket, and it was a denial of transubstantiation. It was a denial because the scriptures did not support the idea that there is some kind of illusion, some kind of hocus pocus, and by the way, we get that word and that phrase hocus pocus from hocus corpus meum, the way the priests would conduct the mass and the way they would serve the elements. And they would serve the elements in a cannibalistic way. They would tell the people, that the element of the wine was converted to Jesus' blood. Drink it. Cannibal, cannibal, feast of Baal. It's a Babylonian custom. That's what the church was, was doing. That's what the church was teaching. It became a mystical hocus-pocus ceremony. John Wycliffe denied it. Others had denied it, but he was the first one to get away with it because of his power, because of his prestige. At the Christmas season in 1384, John Wycliffe suffered a stroke preaching in his church here at Luttersworth. The Lollard preacher boys took his body and placed it in this chair, carried him out his door in the south side of the sanctuary, and John Wycliffe died a few days later. The word of God went free. And over the next 150 years, the secret society that he had fueled was going to make it possible for the Great Reformation to come to pass. In late 1384, in the final hours of his life, Wycliffe finished the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. He didn't have knowledge of Hebrew or Greek and was only able to translate from Jerome's Latin Vulgate. Since the printing press had not yet been invented, it took ten months to transcribe a whole Bible by hand. In 1408, the Archbishop of York gathered the church hierarchy at Oxford to discredit and ban Wycliffe's Bible. We therefore decree and ordain that from henceforth no unauthorized person shall translate any part of the Holy Scripture into English or any other language under any form of book or treatise. This would be the first authorized prohibition of the English scriptures, and it formed the basis of many subsequent persecutions. It was an instrument of terror suspended over the heads of all Englishmen who dared to read for themselves the Word of God in their own language. Even after Wycliffe's death, the hatred against him continued among the church hierarchy. In 1428, 44 years after his death, Pope Martin V ordered the bones of Wycliffe to be dug up and burned. The ashes were then thrown into the River Swift near his church. In Czechoslovakia, John Huss had become a disciple of the teachings of John Wycliffe. He would rise up and promote reforms like Wycliffe had done in England. In 1416, he would be tried and burned at the stake. Actual manuscripts of Wycliffe's students were used as kindling to start the fire. His last words were that, in 100 years, a man would be raised up whose calls for reforms and changes could not be suppressed. It was a prophetic utterance 
because 100 years later, on All Saints Day, Halloween Eve, October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther would nail 95 Theses of Contention to the Wittenberg door calling for reforms. Within a stone's throw of this very spot, John Gutenberg invented the printing press in 1455. It was a 10-year effort, and with the help of John Faust, a resident, a very wealthy resident of mines, and a manservant by the name of Peter Schaefer, movable type, and the first printed book came off the presses. That book was the Gutenberg Bible, the Bible in Latin, simply the most beautiful book that has ever been printed. That book today, in the hundred greatest books, the list of those books still ranks number one. It ranks above even the King James Bible in its beauty and in its typography. In the late 15th century, the early part of the 1490s, a professor named Lineacre at Oxford went down to Italy to study the Greek language in one of these Greek refugee camps. And he read the Gospels in Greek. And as he read them, an incredible feeling of frustration came over him. And that night in his diary, Lineacre wrote, either this is not the gospel or we are not Christians. The Latin text was corrupt. It was totally corrupt from the meaning that God wanted communicated. Simultaneously with Lineacre's experience in Italy, John Collette had visited a church, a great church in Florence that was pastored by a man named Savonarola. And the reason that John Collette was so overwhelmed by the ministry of Savonarola is that he would try to get to the church on a Sunday morning and there would be more people outside trying to get in than the church could contain, which was already full to the rafters. John Collette learned what Savonarola was saying. He was allowing the Apostle Paul to speak in the language of the people from these Greek texts. And the response was revival. Well, John Collette went back, started holding chapel services on the university campus. All he did was read the epistles of Paul in the Greek and translate that reading into English to the students that were sitting in the pew. And within a month, the chapel couldn't hold all the young people who wanted to hear this. And John Collette began to do the same thing at London, at St. Paul's Cathedral, that he had done at the chapel up at Oxford. And the results were overwhelming. Within six months, there were 15 to 20,000 people trying to get in St. Paul's Cathedral. Erasmus determined that he had to master this language and he had to fuel these changes. Today, we know the name Erasmus of Rotterdam because he simply was one of the most brilliant people that ever lived. It's kind of interesting. He was probably the last man on earth to know everything, at least everything from a book learning standpoint, because he had read and translated in his lifetime every single piece of literature that was accessible. Erasmus naturally said, well, we need to translate this Bible and print it in Greek and in English and in other languages. He made that announcement to a couple of scholar friends and they were his friends and they said, well, you'll not do it here and you'll not do it anywhere in England, in fact. Erasmus was frustrated. He said, okay, if I can't do it here, I'll go to the continent and do it. Erasmus, with manuscripts barred from Thomas More and from John Collette and from friends at the University of Paris took enough Greek manuscripts to basically make up a complete New Testament and went to Basel in Switzerland and there in 1514 and 1515 sat down and began to assemble a Greek text for the printing press. Erasmus died in this house in 1536. The house today is an antiquarian bookshop and it's the place where John Froben
had his presses, and in a period of 20 years, from 1516 until 1536, produced over 25,000, perhaps as many as 35,000, of Erasmus's greatest contribution to, to scholarship and to the study of the Bible, which was his Greek, Latin text, first printed in 1516. The Archbishop of Mines, with a copy of Erasmus's Greek Latin text in his hands, made the declaration that, first of all, in truth, he did not know what this book was, but he was convinced that what it contained condemned him. The following exhortation in the preface of the Erasmus New Testament demonstrates his courage. I utterly dissent from those who are unwilling that the sacred scriptures should be read by the unlearned, translated into their own vulgar tongue. I wish that even the weakest woman should read the Gospels and the epistles of St. Paul. I long that the farmer should sing some portion of them to himself as he follows the plow. Erasmus's translation became a primary source for Martin Luther's German translation six years later and William Tyndale's English translation three years after that. The first English convert to the Reformation was burned at the stake in 1531. His name was Thomas Bilney, a pioneer of the English Reformation. In 1517, Bilney was training for the priesthood at Cambridge University. He left his dormitory room one evening and made his way to a bookshop where forbidden books were sold. He purchased a copy of Erasmus' Greek Latin New Testament. Hiding that night under a cover with his illegal purchase and flickering candle, he felt the strong light of God pour into his soul. He read in Timothy 1.15 where Paul stated that he was the chiefest of sinners and that Jesus Christ came into the world to seek and save those who were lost. Bilney cried out, No, I'm the chiefest of sinners. He became so enthusiastic about faith and about acting on the promises of God that hundreds of young men were converted to Christianity on the Cambridge campus. One night he confessed his sins to Professor Hugh Latimer. During his confession, he proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his diary, Latimer wrote that he learned more about God and more about salvation from Bilney's confession than his previous ten years at Cambridge University. In 1519, Bilney was ordained a priest and received his license to preach. He became a powerful force in distributing Tyndale's New English Bible and other forbidden literature throughout England. He eventually was arrested, tried, and sentenced to be burned at the stake. Through his faith, Thomas Bilney believed that God would not allow him to feel the heat of the flames. He comforted his friends the night before his burning and told them that he would not feel the heat of the flames. He said, Though the fire should be of great heat to my body, yet the comfort of God's Spirit should cool it to my everlasting refreshing. The next morning, William Tyndale's Bibles were used as kindling to start the fire. Imagine an English-speaking world without Shakespeare, Tennyson, T.S. Eliot, and C.S. Lewis. They all had one common influence, a man whose prose and creativity in designing the English language is one of the greatest contributions to Western civilization in the annals of modern history. The father of the English language and the sole translator of the Bible into modern English must certainly be revered by every Christian and every English-speaking man or woman wherever English is taught. Surely such a man would have died in honor and wealth and was respected by all. In fact, his life and work are scarcely known to the intellectual community, much less to the common masses. And he died in poverty and in exile from his native country of England. To the establishment, William Tyndale was an outlaw, 
He had a price on his head and was hunted relentlessly for 11 years by his king and by his church. His only crime was obedience to God and thus resistance to tyranny. William Tyndale was born in 1494 in Gloucestershire, England. He enrolled at Oxford in 1505 and literally grew up at the university, receiving his master's degree in 1515 at age 23. He spoke eight different languages fluently. One associate described him as so skilled in eight tongues that whichever he speaks, you might think it is his native tongue. He eventually moved on to Cambridge University, where he formed the White Horse Inn Society. The society was composed of about 25 young men. All of them, with the exception of Miles Coverdale, would be beheaded or burned at the stake. Thousands of others were martyred as well. In 1517, five men and two women were tried for heresy. Their crime? Teaching the Lord's Prayer to their children in English. They were found guilty and burned at the stake. Their martyrdom spoke clearly of the insanity that had possessed the church. England and the entire continent was a war zone of upheaval and widespread persecution. William Tyndale came under suspicion for his views on the authority of Scripture and his views on the interpretation of the Bible. In fact, in one of those heated discussions one day around the table, one of the local bishops, a very powerful man, said that he revered the Pope's laws more than he did Scripture. And William Tyndale could not constrain himself. He looked that bishop in the eye and he said, I defy the Pope and all his laws, and if God would spare my life these many years, I will make it possible for the boy that drives the plow to know as much scripture as you do. He was called before the most powerful bishop in Bristol and warned that if he continued to teach in English the things of God, that he was going to have to suffer the consequences, and those consequences were not going to be easy. It became clear he had to leave. His burden had developed to translate the Bible into English. In 1524, with assistance from the secret society and with a strategy and a carefully laid plan, Tyndale would go to Wittenberg, visit with Martin Luther, and then at a given point in time show up in Cologne on the Rhine River to print the Bible in English, at least the New Testament for the first time. We know that the word has been leaked to the Inquisition, to bounty hunters that are in the employ of the church as well as in the employ of the monarch to track down these dissidents, these men that want to violate laws regarding the translation of the Bible. The bounty hunter goes to the city authorities and gets a search warrant and a seizure warrant and proceeds to the print shop. Simultaneously, Tyndale's tipped off. He gets to the print shop before the bounty hunter gets there. He seizes his manuscripts. He seizes the text that's on the press. Only the first few chapters of Matthew have been printed in a beautiful, beautiful printing. And he escapes literally within minutes of the bounty hunter coming through the front door and they go up the river. In fact, they go up the river about 50 miles to a city called Worms. Peter Schaefer, Jr., was now living in Worms and was a Lutheran, had been converted to the Lutheran doctrine. And it was to this man, the son of the printer of the first Bible, the Gutenberg Bible, that William, Tyn William Tyndale goes to, and 6,000 copies of that Bible are printed in worms, loaded onto ships, and bound for England. In October 1526, Bishop Tunstall preached a sermon denouncing Tyndale's New Testament in English, and copies were publicly burned. However, this backfired because it created a public interest in the New Testament. The mystery of the forbidden book in English 
created a demand no amount of advertising could have accomplished. The bishop then decided to disperse large sums of money for the purchase of as many of the New Testaments as he could get his hands on. He stated, I will gladly pay whatever they cost, for the books are naughty, and I intend surely to destroy them all and to burn them at Paul's cross. Tyndale's life was that of a nomad, traveling from place to place to avoid detection, translating and revising as he could. Finally, in exhaustion, he chose the English house at Antwerp to oversee the transport of his books to England. The year was 1533. For nine years he had managed, with the help of friends, to evade authorities as he revised his New Testament and began translating the Old Testament. In the meantime, church officials were financing a bounty hunter by the name of Henry Phillips to track down Tyndale. Phillips went to Antwerp and managed to worm his way into Tyndale's life. Soon, Phillips became a guest of Tyndale's at meals and was one of the few privileged to look at his books and papers. In May 1535, Phillips devised a plan that would lure Tyndale away from the safety of his quarters. While slipping through a narrow alley, Tyndale walked into the arms of a band of soldiers whom Phillips had posted. He was immediately arrested and taken to the state prison at the castle of Vilvor, where he was accused of heresy. He spent the last 500 days of his life in a cold, dark, and lonely cell, deep inside the castle. The only record of this time is contained in a letter he wrote to the governor of the castle in the winter months of 1535. I beg your lordship and that by the Lord Jesus, that if I am to remain here through the winter, you will be kind enough to send me from my goods a warmer cap, for I suffer greatly from cold in the head, and am afflicted by inflammation and congestion. A warmer coat also, for that which I have is very thin. And above all, I beg and beseech your clemency to kindly permit me to have my Hebrew Bible, Hebrew grammar, and Hebrew dictionary, that I may spend my time with that study. I shall be patient, abiding the will of God to the glory of the grace of my Lord Jesus Christ, whose spirit, I pray, may ever direct your heart. Amen. William Tyndale. Was Tyndale's request allowed? We do not know. On October 6, 1536, William Tyndale was led to the public square near a large beam. Tyndale was given one last chance to recant. When he refused, he was given a moment to pray. He then cried out, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. He was then chained to the beam and a rope was put around his neck. At the signal of the local official, the executioner tightened the noose and strangled him. The executioner then set the wood ablaze. God answered William Tyndale's last prayer. The prayer was, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. In 1537, John Rogers printed the first Bible in England with a license granted by Henry VIII. The year preceding Tyndale's death, after his incarceration, Miles Coverdale would print the first English Bible from Luther's German Bible, but it's the work, 95, 96, 97 percent, the work of William Tyndale. Henry VIII took it one step further, though. He authorized, by royal injunction, the printing of 20,000 Bibles, called the Great Bible, to be distributed to every church in England, William Tyndale's Bible. What I want to try to do here is go through and show the viewer how sincere Luther and Tyndale were in trying to get the words that they were translating to form a picture. Now, the book of the Revelation is probably the most difficult book of the whole Bible to understand because it's prophecy that's yet to be fulfilled. So in the book of the Revelation, woodcuts were used in a very generous way and marginal notes were used in a very generous way to help explain to the reader the way the reformers back in the early 16th century saw the book of the Revelation unfolding. And the opening chapter of the book of Revelation from this Tyndale New Testament shows
Jesus Christ himself giving the Apostle John this vision. And it's very clear that that the Lord himself is speaking to John, and John, sitting at the bottom of the picture, is writing down every single word of this incredible vision that the Lord has given to him. Outside of the Bible, Fox's Book of Martyrs was the most popular book of the 16th century. It was filled with woodcuts showing how the established church persecuted its dissidents. It wasn't an evil monarch or a wicked king that would perpetuate crimes against God and man. It was the established church that wrought fear and trembling to freedom-loving people throughout Europe. Fox declared that we must be a protesting, resisting people in order to maintain freedom. Thus, resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. After the death of Edward VI in 1553, Queen Mary came into power with the ambition of burning every Protestant who would not recant and submit to the established church in Rome. John Rogers was burned first because he was the closest to William Tyndale. But Miles Coverdale fled the country just days before they would have captured him. Thousands of English Christians were driven out of England with little hope of ever seeing their homeland again. Those who did not leave were rounded up like cattle and burned at the stake. It would often take hours for the person to die, depending on how the wind would blow on a particular day. In order for mercy to be exercised, their friends would often tie bags of gunpowder around their necks hoping it would explode and kill the poor victim in a merciful manner. Over 300 leading Protestant scholars in England would be burned at the stake during the four years of Queen Mary's reign. Most of the English refugees fled to the church at Geneva, Switzerland, which was one of the only few safe havens for them. They knew that if they acted on the promises, God would see them through this horrible hour of persecution. Several of these men, including Miles Coverdale and John Knox, decided to reprint the Bible from William Tyndale's text, but with thousands of explanatory notes that promoted learning and understanding of the text. The Geneva Bible became a masterpiece of Reformation literature. The notes were so thorough and complete, it became equivalent to a Bible school in a single volume. A man in Paris, Robert Stevens, had separated the text into verses in 1550, making it the first Bible in history to be printed with verses. In 1560, the first printing of 150 Geneva Bibles came off the press. For the next 250 years, it would be the Bible of choice for Protestants. Later editions would print commentaries that were critical of the established church in Rome. A 1595 edition added notes that the beast coming out of the bottomless pit in Revelation 11.7 is the Pope, which hath his power out of hell, and cometh thence. It was the Geneva Bible that William Shakespeare quotes from over 5,000 times in his plays. It was the Geneva Bible that came over on the Mayflower with the pilgrims. It was the Bible of the Puritans. It was the Bible that John Smith and John Rolfe would bring to America in 1607 and was used to lead Pocahontas and her people to Christ. Over a hundred years ago in the 1880s, to honor the birth, the 400th anniversary of the birth of Martin Luther, the city fathers built behind us this wonderful collection of statues to men of faith who prepared the way for Martin Luther and prepared the way for the Protestant Reformed Reformation Church of the 16th century. In the middle of the collection of uh, wonderful statues is Martin Luther, but also 
There's the statue of Peter Waldo, the Waldensian, the man who epitomized what the suffering persecution of the Inquisition accomplished by literally destroying a whole population of people. Scripture was corrupt in the Latin. It had been made so by a, a dishonest church, by a church that would twist and pervert even Scripture in order to accomplish their agenda. And it's a wonderful, passionate story that each one of them brings to the overall success that the Reformation was able to afford us all. Martin Luther came to Wittenberg in 1508. It wasn't by accident. He was chosen by the secret society of Lollards to come here and chair the professorship of philosophy. As he developed and matured in his studies in the 13 years that led up to the Diet of Worms in 1521, that event being preceded by Erasmus's Greek Latin Bible printed in 1516 and the combination of events that happened in this city on Halloween in 1517 at which time Luther nailed his 95 theses to the Wittenberg door of the castle church right behind me. Luther was ready in 1517 to proclaim the message of faith. You study the scriptures, you search the scriptures, Martin Luther said, in order to know God and to know his promises. Because you see from his study of the 11th chapter of Hebrews and the 6th verse, without acting on the promises, it's impossible to please God. Martin Luther's conversion came from a study of the book of Habakkuk in an indirect way from the second chapter and the fourth verse, he remembered a passage that the just shall live by his faith. In Martin Luther's subsequent study of the book of Romans, the first chapter and the 17th verse, he read the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by acting on the promises. From 1516, to 1546, Martin Luther only preached one message from this pulpit in this church. Hebrews 11, verse 1, faith, that is, acting on the promises, is defined as the sure confidence, the invisible reality, the ground of the heart of things hoped for. In the United States, we celebrate our Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July because on that day in 1776, the Founding Fathers, risking everything, put their signature to a document proclaiming their liberty and their freedom. On the 17th day of April in 1521, as Christians around the world, that is our Declaration of Independence Day, because one man stood against the emperor and against his critics and against those that would have him burned at the stake in this building behind me, the Cathedral of Worms in Germany. And Martin Luther, that man, that monk, stood before his inquisitors and stood before those who sought to slay him. He stood before him with the fullest comprehension that that was going to be his last day on earth. And he declared for you and for me as Christians, our independence. As he stood in front of the court, he made one of the most remarkable speeches in history, a speech that would take only 10 seconds to deliver. My conscience is my guide, scripture is my authority, and I can do no other than abide by its teachings. Here I stand, God help me. Luther was convinced that he would be burned at the stake, but his friends kidnapped him and took him to Prince Frederick's castle in Wartburg. With the help of Erasmus's Greek Latin Bible, he translated the Bible into the German language in 90 days. The first copies came off the press in September of 1522. The driving force in Martin Luther's life was the fear of God. With William Tyndale, 
It was the belief that God had chosen him that possessed him. Their love and respect for God overcame their personal fears and persuaded them to undertake a work that, from a human perspective, was virtually impossible. Tyndale would have failed without Luther, and Luther would have failed without Tyndale. In 1604, the Puritan party would approach King James with the idea of a new translation of the Bible. King James agreed on the condition that it not have any notes. He then selected about 50 scholars that were well acquainted with Hebrew and Greek. They were divided into six groups. The text, including the Apocrypha, was divided among the groups, and each group member was required to work on the whole of its portion. In practice, the translators made extensive use of the great English Bibles, including Tyndale's Bible, the Geneva Bible, and the Bishop's Bible. They also consulted the original languages, the Hebrew and Greek. Over the next six years, they styled the English so that it was easy to memorize. In 1610, when they finished their work, over 90% of William Tyndale's words had passed into the King James Version. Their thorough approach made the King James Bible the most accurate that had ever been written. In 1611, the first printing of 20,000 King James Bibles came off the press, one for each of the 20,000 churches in England. It would become the greatest single book that has ever been printed in the history of man. The King James Bible has a message of faith, grace, peace, and hope and has saved millions of people from eternal damnation. It is revered as God's book, His story, His control over the millenniums of time from the creation to the present, and its influence over the civilized world wherever English-speaking people have traveled is unparalleled. The King James Bible of 1611 was printed with 80 books, including the 14 apocryphal books. In fact, the daily reading guide in the front of the King James Bible included the apocrypha as part of one's daily reading as you read through the Bible in a year. Archbishop Abbott, himself a member of the original translation committee, worried that some future publisher might exclude the apocrypha. In 1615, he warned of a fine and penalty of one year in prison to anyone who printed the King James Bible without the Apocrypha. The fine was equal to several hundred thousand dollars, an enormous sum of money. It was more than a warning. It was a threat. Don't do it. The 14 Apocryphal books were part of the Septuagint which was a Greek translation of the 2nd century B.C. that Jesus and the Apostles would later quote from. In fact, at the time of Christ, the book of Daniel contained 15 chapters, including three Apocrypha books, Song of the Three Children, Bell and the Dragon, and Susanna. In 382, Jerome was commissioned to translate the Bible from the Greek into Latin. He put an asterisk by the apocryphal books in A.D. 390. He questioned their inspiration because he could not find them in the original Hebrew text. History proves that the 14 apocryphal books were part of God's Word for 2,000 years until 1885 A.D. when the British and foreign Bible societies excluded them from the revised version. Thus, we are the first generation of Christians that has had the Apocrypha excluded from our Bibles. The power of God's Word in English has also been manifested over the centuries in its influence on common law and democratic government, finding expression in the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and the U.S. Constitution. In America, the Bible in English was the textbook for liberty. Thus, the courage to rebel from Mother England 
was undertaken from a conviction that resistance to tyranny was obedience to God. During the Revolutionary War, the Continental Congress was nicknamed the Bible Congress because of their constant effort in getting Bibles to the troops and the common people. By 1777, the British embargo had stopped almost all Bibles coming into the country, and there were not enough Bibles to go around. So Congress authorized the import of 20,000 Bibles from Holland, Scotland, or elsewhere into different ports of the States of the Union. We are looking at the frontispiece in the Brown Family Bible, which is one of the most important Bibles ever printed in America. In 1792, we have a depiction of liberty. She has an Indian headdress, and her subjects are presenting to her the Holy Bible. On the great building behind her is engraved the words that best describe the importance of the Bible in America's future. It states, Sacred to liberty, justice, and peace. In order to print a Bible this expensive, subscribers first had to be enlisted. As we turn the page, we get an insight into who the families were that could afford this beautiful Bible. The very first subscriber was George Washington, the first President of the United States. It is a list of who's who in America. Names like John Jay, the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, who later became President of the American Bible Society, as did John Quincy Adams. In 1791, there was such a demand for Bibles that two printers, Isaac Collins and Isaiah Thomas, published the first family Bible. This would establish the Bible in the 200 plus years to follow as the best-selling book year in and year out in America. In the English-speaking world, the Bible has been the bestseller, without exception, for over 350 years. Thomas and Collins' Bibles set the standard of excellence that would see the Bible through 5,000 editions over the next 110 years, as the Bible would establish America as the great light of the world through the agency of Bible societies and missionaries. Luther and Tyndale rediscovered faith the lost message of the church. An expression of the power of God's word can be found in the works of those such as Shakespeare and Spencer, who plagiarized Tyndale's English Bible in their writings. This elevates English literature to a level of excellence, uniting people to a love of freedom which is being realized as much today as it was in the darkest hours of the Reformation.